All right, everybody. Um, I'm going to introduce our first afternoon speaker, uh, whom I'm really excited to hear from. Um, JP uh, is a researcher at Stanford University who specializes in using UAVs to study the marine environment. Combining machine learning technology, GIS, and high resolution remote sensing equipment, he has developed novel techniques for mapping coral reefs, kelp forests, and groundwater runoff. His more recent work seeks to count and detect marine animals such as sharks, rays, sea otters, and whales with improved accuracy via UAV-based remote sensing. And I just wanted to mention, um, JP reached out to me, I think it was months and months ago, maybe in 2019, asking if he knew, if we knew anyone who'd be interested in a, a sea otter UAV project, and I'm pretty sure every sea otter person in the state descended upon him. <laughs> So we were very excited about this idea and we're living um, with him on this project now. And with that, I will turn it over to JP. Cool, thank you so much, Jenna, for that introduction. Um, and also, uh, I wanna take a moment to say uh, thank you to both everyone that is attending this symposium. I think it's really cool to see this kind of engagement um, and desire to learn about these really important issues, as well as all the other panelists who have um, Spoken. I've really enjoyed this morning's presentations um, and have learned a lot of cool things. So, uh, and then also to everyone that helped to organize this um, symposium, I want to say really th uh, thank you. Um, but yeah, so as Jenna introduced me, um, my name's JP and I'm a researcher at Stanford. Um, and um, I specialize in UAV remote sensing of marine environments. Um, so, what exactly does that mean? So, a UAV is an unmanned aerial vehicle, um, also known as a drone. Um, and um, I've had the pleasure of um, using these to look at um, a variety of scientific questions um, and these uh, enable us to look at the world in a, a cool new way that I think is going to um, enable a lot of uh, really important conservation research in the um, future. So I've done work at looking at um, uh, animal behavior such as sharks, um, also getting population counts of birds, to getting um, counting sessile organisms like sea cucumbers, um, mapping large scale structures of coral reefs. Uh, we even use these ones to um, survey marine plastics on um, uninhabited islands that we couldn't get to. Um, you can use these in conjunction with other technologies like machine learning to make um, maps of um, coastal environments like coral reefs, um, or even finding groundwater runoff when you mount infrared cameras onto these that can find sources of pollution. Um, and then more recently, um, I've been using it for mapping kelp forests, um, which um, is really important right now with the um, using climate change, um, which is affecting the growth of these and being able to track that um, accurately uh, in a way we've never been able to before. Um, so, uh, as Jenna said, I um, reached out to Sea Otter Savvy um, because I was going to be doing these kelp mapping projects and wanted to make sure that I wasn't um, disturbing sea otters in the process. And then out of those talks, um, we decided to um, come together to do this project, um, which is ongoing. So today I'm only going to be able to share um, the preliminary results of that this project is still ongoing and we've yet to analyze all of our data. Um, but this was a, a partnership between myself um, sea Otter Savvy, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the California Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, I'm representing work um, that is much bigger than just what I've been able to do. Um, and so um, the motivation for why we wanted to learn more about how sea otters react to drones um, is kind of twofold. Um, so here's a graph from Goldman Sachs that shows um, the growth in the consumer drone market. Um, and as you can see here, um, it's grown by over an order of magnitude since 2013. Um, and this is obviously expected to continue. Um, so um, every Christmas season, you can expect tourists to be um, picking up more and more drones and bringing them with them to the coast. Um, and um, alongside that, there's also been um, a dramatic increase in the use of UAVs for scientific research. So this is a graph of academic publications that have used UAV. Um, and as you can see, this graph is more exponential in shape and is showing no signs of slowing down. Um, and as someone in this field, um, I can tell you both um, that the types of data um, and analysis that we're able to do are really exciting um, and really promising for conservation work. We're able to get a look at the natural world we've never had before. Um, but on top of that, um, a lot of researchers um, 
don't realize the potentials for disturbance to the environments that they're studying, um, which is why I think it's it's um, really important that uh, this type of work that I've been able to do with Sea Otter Savvy and Fish and Wildlife Service um, happens so that not only can we use this technology to um, benefit conservation efforts, but we can do so without creating um, new problems um, ourselves. So um, specifically to sea otters, um, as most of you probably know, sea otters are um, threatened under the Endangered Species Act um, and also protected under the Marine Mammals Protection Act. So this means that it is illegal to alter their behavior in any way. Um, and sea otters have really busy days. They spend about eight hours a day feeding, six hours a day grooming, and 12 hours sleeping and resting. And all of these behaviors are really important um, to their survival. And if we um, mess with any of these, the effects can compound and mess up their um, whole daily schedule. And um, especially with repeated disturbance events um, can really, um, really hurt their chances of survival, especially mothers that not only have to take care of and feed themselves, but their pups. Um, so yesterday I just Googled um, sea otter drones and found these uh, images um, on stock footage websites. So photographers upload footage that they take to sell it to other people. Um, and pretty much every example I found um, showed uh, some photographer taking their drone up to a sea otter and, and then disturbing them. Um, and I think the issue here really comes from um, you know, uh, ignorance of um, all of these new photographers that are out there with these drones, that's a new technology, not really understanding um, the potential implications of using these, especially around sea otters. Um, and so figuring out exactly how we can safely use these um, around sea otters as well as other animals, um, and then um, propagating that information, I think is, is definitely the next step. Um, but on top of that, there's a lot of um, possible scientific uses that if we learn how to safely use drones around sea otters, um, we can pursue these scientific objectives um, that can also help in our um, sea otter management strategies. Um, so this is a list that uh, I came up with um, alongside all of the sea otter researchers that I'm working with on this project. Um, and everyone, kind of as Jenna said, showed a lot of excitement at using these technologies. So traditionally when we monitor sea otters, we do so with spotting scopes that are pretty much telescopes to look at them um, uh, offshore. And then if they're really far offshore, um, it can be really hard to get good observations, um, but drones can fly easily one or two kilometers out to be right on top of them. Um, also observation gets difficult under varying sea conditions. Uh, there's a lot of swell. Um, you can lose sight of the otters between every wave, which doesn't happen if you're flying a drone. Um, also, we're excited about using this for looking at behavioral um, observations and group dynamics among sea otters, um, as well as counting large groups of sea otters, identifying their prey. Um, and something else we realized through our field work is that uh, this technology is really useful for monitoring other types of disturbances, not only the disturbances that drones could potentially cause. Um, for example, here's a really typical scene at Cannery Row. Um, so on a weekend, you can expect groups of kayakers to come by every 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and the current guidelines are that you should stay about five boat lengths away from the sea otters. And when you're looking at um, the way that humans are interacting with sea otters through a spotting scope, it can be really hard to judge distances when you're looking in a telescope, but this new perspective makes it extremely easy to see um, that this kayaker was only two boat lengths away from the nearest otter, way too close. Um, and that this kayaker, even a little farther away, was three boat lengths away. And this was something pretty typical. We would see this at Canary Row quite, uh, quite often um, and much uh, worse examples. Um, also, um, one day while we were out there observing, we saw this video, um, or we saw this happen, um, where uh, it was a really beautiful day. Sailboats were out all over the bay. and. Um, they, uh, this one sailboat just kind of came in too close. Uh, but yeah, these examples just show how um, the, there's a lot of potential uses for using drones um, in um, monitoring sea otters as well as potential disturbances to them. Um, so there are actually current guidelines to how to use drones in the Monterey Bay Marine National Sanctuary. Um, and these guidelines are shown here at the right. So um, below 20 meters, you need a, a special use permit. Um, that's really hard to get. Um, so uh, that generally doesn't happen. But then between 20 meters and 60 meters, um, you need to have a sea otter monitor, an experienced sea otter monitor that can watch the sea otter while you're flying a drone and then submit a report later on the event. And then above 60 meters, that's not prohibited or regulated by the Monterey Bay Marine National Sanctuary. However, these guidelines are based off of only a small number of anecdotal observations, as well as 
research on threat responses to other stimuli. Um, but they don't take into account, for example, different types of drones, different size drones, or even different types of flight patterns or other things that could affect um, how um, sea otters respond to drones. Um, so there's a, there's a strong need to validate these guidelines based on actual data of sea otter responses to UAVs. Um, so uh, here's a, an image that shows um, an example of what that lower altitude limit. So at 60 feet or 20 meters, the, the lowest you can currently fly, you could tell at this image, at this altitude, um, you could gather, um, you can see enough information to determine individual sea otters. You could maybe see um, if they're tagged. Um, it'd be really useful for um, observing um, group dynamics and social behavior between sea otters or identifying their prey. Um, however, this, uh, this is the upper limit. Uh, this is what you could fly at without a permit or uh, without a monitor present at 200 feet with that yellow box for comparison to um, the lower limit. Um, here it'd be much harder um, to um, get accurate counts of sea otters or to do those other, uh, answer other scientific questions. But that isn't to say that there aren't its own um, niches for um, uh, flying at this altitude for research. Um, so given these motivations of both the consumer um, uh, market increasing as well as potential scientific um, uses for drones for sea otter monitoring, um, we came up with the following study objectives. One, we wanted to characterize sea otter responses to a typical UAV. Um, we also want to develop and publish a best practices guide for operating UAVs um, around sea otters. So this could be something that filmmakers and photographers, uh, researchers, or even the general public could use to learn more about um, the safest ways of, of using drones. Um, we also wanted to develop a protocol for monitoring sea otter responses to drones. Um, so um, our study is preliminary and only looks at one type of drone and one type of flight pattern. Um, so we hope to kind of standardize the way um, we can um, determine um, sea otter responses to UAVs in the future. Um, and then also um, I'm prototyping a machine learning algorithm that would help for automatically detecting and counting sea otters to improve future monitoring and research efforts. And um, I'll, I'll go into what exactly that means um, later in the presentation. Um, so for this project, we selected uh, DJI Mavic 2 Pro. So this image in the center um, shows that next to me for scale. Um, and so we chose this drone because um, it's the largest consumer drone available. So any kind of observations or um, uh, regulations that we could make based off of how sea otters respond to this one would also be applicable to all the smaller drones that consumers are able to purchase. So in the top right, um, those are some of the three most popular drones are available on the market right now. Um, so anything we could determine for this large drone would work for the smaller drones. But it's really important to note that there are much larger drones available. So here on the bottom right, um, shows um, a drone that you could expect to be used by a professional um, documentary filmmaking crew um, or perhaps researchers that need um, really large sensors. So whatever um, observations we're able to make with this drone um, would only be applicable for um, uh, determining guidelines for uh, drones in the consumer class um, and not these larger um, scale uh, research drones. Um, so our methodology uh, was pretty simple. We had three locations around the Monterey Peninsula where we would fly uh, weekly. Um, we would do about three flights um, and we would uh, take off and then fly to that max altitude of 200 feet and then fly directly over a raft of sea otters. Uh, and then we would hover for one minute before descending 10 feet and then hover for another minute and then descend another 10 feet. And we did this throughout the entire range of the 200 foot to 60 foot range, which is um, where you are currently allowed to fly around sea otters if you have a monitor present. Um, and then we got to the bottom, we would hover for another minute and then turn back and then work our way up again and then fly home. Um, and concurrently, we had uh, usually two to three um, highly experienced sea otter monitors that uh, were watching the sea otters continuously and they would record the sea otters behaviors every minute. Um, and then as well, uh, we would have a control where we would have a baseline observation where before the drone uh, even flew in the air, we would observe the sea otters for uh, a 20 minute period to be able to compare the sea otters behavior both when there's no drone present and then when there is a drone present at these various altitudes. Um, and the monitors would follow one focal otter. So they would choose an otter and then track that one and record its behavior. So having multiple 
um, monitors allowed us to um, sample a larger um, proportion of, of the rafts that we were looking at. Um, and uh, preliminary report. So uh, we were able to conduct 33 flights so far, which is roughly eight hours of observations with drones um, in the air. Um, and I don't wanna make any statements today about um, how the sea otters did respond to the drone because we haven't done the, the statistical analysis and um, there's lots of uh, biases that could come into play. So any anecdotal stories about um, how sea otters respond to drones, I think, um, uh, it's not the point of, of this uh, quantitative study, so I'll refrain from making any comments there. Um, and also the machine learning algorithm that uh, I'm about to talk about is under production and we hope to make it publicly available for use um, by researchers when completed. Um, so as I, as I mentioned before, there's this technology called object detection. It's a, a sub-branch of machine learning or artificial intelligence. Um, and is a technology that was designed by companies like Facebook and Google um, for use uh, primarily in self-driving cars. Uh, so as you can see here, this technology allows a computer to analyze a video or photos and determine what objects are in that image. And so this is a, um, you know, billions of dollars have been thrown at this problem and some really smart people have been working on it. Um, so being able to take advantage of this technology um, for research and conservation purposes is really exciting. Um, and the use case that I, that I envision for it um, is so, so here's a typical image um, that you would get at a typical altitude of flying a drone over sea otters if you were doing research. Um, and when it's blown up like this, it's pretty easy to determine what's um, on the screen. But when you're actually out there flying, um, it's on your tiny little uh, remote controller and it can be pretty hard to find these sea otters. Um, so an object detection algorithm could help you uh, as a pilot both to find these otters, um, which could potentially enable you to fly at higher altitudes and minimize your chances of disturbing them. Um, also in processing your data later when you're back at home, um, it could uh, yeah, enable um, really efficient ways of analyzing um, your data. Um, so the couple things that I can report to you about that were pretty interesting um, that we've learned from our fieldwork so far um, is that besides the direct disturbance of drones on sea otters, we've learned it's really important to um, think about indirect disturbances. So a couple uh, situations we encountered uh, involved having seagulls um, attacking the drone while we were flying over. So they um, exhibited behaviors similar to how they responded when birds of prey would come nearby. So you could have a flock of 20 or so seagulls um, reacting to and, and coming at the drone to try to scare it away. Um, and our hypothesis was that um, the sea otters weren't necessarily responding to the drone, but to the commotion involved with a large flock of gulls. But this is still important um, in setting our guidelines for safe drone behavior around sea otters. Um, so uh, we want to uh, make sure we incorporate these indirect disturbances into our um, guidelines as well. Um, and also we learned that it's pretty difficult to determine whether changes in the sea otter behavior are um, caused by the drone or by something else, which is why it's really important to have guidelines um, because if you're sitting there as a pilot, you can't always determine whether you're um, disturbing the sea otters or whether it's something else. So that's why this statistical analysis with a lot of data is important. Um, an example of that um, shows here on the top left is a video we took of sea otters um, that as you see will have flushed. Um, and this is what you would see if you were looking through a spotting scope. And then we also have the video associated with it from the, when the drone was flying overhead. So when you look at just the spotting scope video, um, all you get from that data is that the drones flood, uh, that the sea otters flush, and it's kind of hard to determine the cause. Um, but then uh, as you look here, when you look at it from the drone's perspective, um, you can see that it seems most likely that the flush was caused by another sea otter coming into the group. Also, I really like these videos because it shows the, the new perspective that drones can give us on, on observing sea otter behavior. Um, yeah, so um, that's the, all I have for you today. And I want to acknowledge um, both all of the people that helped with this. Um, so Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment um, helped fund this project. Um, and then the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Colleen um, Young, and then um, Leanne Clarkswell from the California uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife um, were um, really active in the design of this study as well as um, Jenna and Sea Otter Savvy. Um, also the Black Oyster Catcher Group Monitoring Project, they, they came out to almost all of our flights um, to make sure we weren't disturbing the black oyster catchers, um, which is also really important. So thank you for them. And thank you to Michelle Stadler, who, who 
volunteered lots of our time. And also I think it's important to show um, that we were permitted for all of the flights we did, which uh, is not a very easy process, um, but here on the right uh, shows that um, we did go through the necessary steps to make sure that um, we were doing this right, which I think a lot of drone researchers don't um, do. So I think it's uh, pretty important. Um, and yeah, we can um, open it up for questions here, I think. Thank you, JP. Um, I've got quite a, quite a list of questions questions for you. The first one is from Jan. She says, can you extrapolate the data, also include black oyster catchers and harbor seals? Any data or observations on that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the black oyster catcher group was um, uh, making their own observations and I think has their own plans um, for um, helping to determine um, how, how that species responds to drones. Um, and as you mentioned, um, uh, seals um, are also um, pretty susceptible to disturbance by drones. Um, so I, I, I can only really talk about um, sea otters. It's the only thing I've worked with, but um, I think that highlights the fact that, yes, yeah, it's, it's important to, when we're using these drones and we want to fly over marine environment, that we that we consider how every species would react to it. Um, so I think, yeah, a lot of work. Awesome. Thank you. Um, a man, or sorry, Heather says, Combining the fishing and drone, um, have you all heard of drone fishing? I've recently heard of this where people stand on the shore and use a drone to take their line way out to the ocean for fishing. It seems like it would have the potential for so many wildlife issues. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, you can just go online and you buy a little attachment that you put onto these consumer drones you buy and it can take your line. Um, way out. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good demonstration of how the, the drone market um, has exploded recently and all of these new technologies and potentials for harming wildlife are coming about, um, which is why I think it's really important that we uh, take the time to think critically about these new technologies and make sure that, um, that we don't inadvertently harm something just because we um, introduced the technologies without yeah, thinking about potential consequences. But yeah, those are um, pretty getting pretty popular. Thank you. Um, Amanda says, this sounds like an excellent reproducible study method. Has it been done with other species to gauge UAV sensitivity? You kind of address this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like I showed in that graph, um, UAV research on animals has really taken off. Um, and I actually don't know of many studies that look at um, uh, wildlife responses. Um, you know, just now studies are being published about using these for the first time to look at whales, to look at sea turtles. Um, I'm also working on projects to look at, at, at sharks. Um, and I think much more on the terrestrial side, um, there's, there's a couple studies that, that do make guidelines for different species. Um, but no, it's, it's definitely a very new technology and a very new branch of science that I think, um, I think the first step we need to do is studies like this. Um, how do we make sure not to disturb them now once we've determined that then we can move forward with studying them. But I, I think right now, not enough um, effort is being placed there. Um, yeah. Sarah wants to know, um, she says it's fantastic to be able to see the kelp from above. How does a UAV operator know how high they are? Yeah, so different UAVs use different technologies, but it's a combination of both GPS technology as well as um, barometric uh, sensors. So, um, the UAVs can hold a, a level flight by staying at a constant air pressure. Um, and they're pretty accurate. They'll, um, you know, maybe drift, they'll have like a one foot margin. So yeah, a combination of GPS sensors on board that give its 3D position in space, um, as well as uh, pressure sensors. Do you incorporate any 3D modeling or photogrammetry in? in mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, that's a technology I've worked with a lot, actually. Um, particularly, you need clear waters um, to get uh, 3D models. But uh, something I'm also working on is making 3D models of coral reefs um, and then using that to get much more accurate um, benthic maps instead of a 2D map of a coral reef getting a 3D one. But that's also a really exciting technology that I think goes hand in hand. It also lets you get um, 3D structures of animals. So you could get a 3D model of a whale and, and uh, if you're flying over a whale with a drone, for example, and be able to determine a lot of physiological characteristics like uh, body mass and um, length and, and many other things. So that that is definitely a technology that goes hand in hand with drones that I'm really excited about. Thank you, JP. Um, one last question. 
when will the study be published? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't want to make any promises there, um, but um, I know that, um, that we're wrapping up on the data collection side uh, and our statisticians have, are going to get started on that soon. So if, keep your fingers crossed and maybe we can um, bring more to you next year's symposium. That sounds great, JP. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, JP. That was great. It's, it was great seeing uh, seeing this actually on a screen.